This is Dateline News and Conversation. My guest tonight, my good friend, Bruce Gagnon from Brunswick, Maine. Bruce, welcome back to the show. Good to see you, Regis. Always. Well, look, you had an election over there uh, a few days ago, and it really captured the attention of people in Russia. I was at a conference in Moscow the day on the 5th uh, that it was taking place. The results were made known on the 6th, and everybody was talking about it. Um, so, Bruce, people here seem to be hopeful that the Donald is going to be an improvement. But there are others who know that nothing will change. Now, before we get into that, uh, what were your thoughts? And I know that you voted for Jill Stein, the Green Party. You could not vote for either Republican or Democrat. It's been a long time uh, for you with that. Uh, how would you describe the tone and the temperature of the American people post this election? Well, let me uh, describe it in a story. Yesterday, we had a statewide protest in Farmington, Maine, a rural town, not very big. Uh, they have a University uh, of Maine uh, college there, part of the University of Maine system. Uh, it's a small school. And uh, we had 30 people out there on the street. They came from all over the state. Uh, and uh, as we were protesting, three big guys in camo walked by and yelled at us, you should have voted for Trump. You know, they assumed, we were, they assumed we were Democrats. I yelled, we're not Democrats. And on their return, when they passed by uh, from wherever they went, I grabbed one of them, the biggest guy, actually, and said, you know, we're not uh, we're not Democrats. Uh, and, and then I said, you know, I'm a veteran, which always helps kind of ease the tension. And then uh, he was saying, uh, well, you know, Trump's going to stop these wars. He said he is. And I said, what if he doesn't? And there was a pregnant pause. And he basically said, then we're screwed. And so it's clear to me that a lot of the people that voted for Trump were responding to the frequent statements during the Trump rallies that he was going to stop all the wars. And there was always a loud cheer for that because people are not stupid. They know that these wars are costing us a lot of money, money that could be invested in America uh, with so many needs that we have, and it's not happening. So uh, anyway, so my take is that the public really does want some real change, even the people that voted for Trump, but I'm not so sure we're going to get it because the Zionists obviously control the United States government today, lock, stock, and barrel. They control the media and they control most of the institutions in this country. And they want the United States to continue to support Israel's war footing, especially this idea of creating greater Israel to expand Israel's control into Egypt, uh, into Lebanon, into Jordan, into Syria, and even into Iraq, parts of Iraq as well. So uh, this is uh, insanity, of course, and ensures World War III, but they don't care. So now as we look at the appointments that Trump is making, we see over and over again people that are not only Christian fundamentalists and believe in the coming of Christ, a return of Christ, you know, through Armageddon and all this kind of thing, but also just hardcore militarists, neocons, the same kind of neocons that we've had for the last many years through the Biden administration, the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and on. So 
Uh, I think, you know, there are a couple uh, appointments that people are somewhat hopeful about, particularly Tulsi Gabbard and RFK Jr. But beyond that, there's not much there. So this is the situation that we're looking at now. Now, you know, you mentioned the Zionist control of the United States government. It's not just the United States government. It's the city of London. Uh, it's the almost the entire world economy has been controlled by the Zionists, the Rothschild clan and others. But what was interesting, Bruce, at the conference, uh, there were, I don't know, maybe 60 people that were gathered around this huge table, circular table. And they were, they were former prime ministers. There was the ambassador for, from Syria to, uh, to Russia. Uh, there were representatives from Iraq, from Lebanon, uh, from uh, even Israel. There was one from Israel who was a friend of Crimea. And the gentleman from Iraq made this incredible speech. And what he wanted to make sure, and nobody else was mentioning this, he said, I have to, to let you know that this is not a war of America against uh, 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 Russia in Ukraine. It's the same Zionist cabal people that are behind this war. They're behind what's happening in Israel. They are behind the threats and intimidation of China they are the ones that are creating chaos all over the world. And then the man from Lebanon spoke, and he said almost the same thing. Now, I had a chance to speak at close to the very end of this, and I said, all I want to say is everybody had better listen to my friend and my brother from Iraq and my brother from Lebanon. We need to understand the enemy is not the United States of America. It's the Zionists. Bruce, I was I was really so happy to hear this. In fact, I interviewed both of them after the conference. Um, so I think we're making a very important point. This is this Zionist cabal, and they have infiltrated the cabinets of, well, presidents back as far as I can remember, certainly Obama. You mentioned neocons. They're all war hawks. Um, the hope for any change in terms of a reduction of the wars around the world, Trump may not start them, but he's already promised that he's almost going to go to war with China. Uh, and, and, you know, if it's not militarily, it'll be tariffs, embargoes, just like he did the first time around. So, what I would like now is your thoughts, because I know you don't believe that it's going to end wars. Um, what are your thoughts on Trump? I'm going to end the war in Ukraine within 24 hours. Well, I read a really good article last night quoting a Russian political science uh, specialist who predicted that the Trump administration is going to back off on Ukraine. Now, what does back off mean? Okay, uh, that's up up for a debate. Uh, but in addition to that, that Trump is going to go after BRICS. This is going to be his primary target. Break up the, the movement in the global south, across the global south, to de-dollarize, to move away from U.S. control and to build a multipolar world. This is the biggest threat to the United States, not just China or Russia or Iran or Venezuela themselves, but this whole uh, institution that's being created, this whole movement around BRICS. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And that's what uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm uh, putting that uh, article on my blog uh, because I think uh, people ought to see what this guy has to say. So anyway, uh, I think that's where it's heading, to make it short and sweet. That's that's the plan. Yeah. I believe and, it's, it makes total sense. Yeah. And from this end, uh, 
you know, Olaf Scholz, uh, prime minister from uh, Germany, called Putin, and Putin repeated what the demands are. And the demands have not changed. And what they mean uh, is Russia has got to go all the way and achieve a complete victory in Ukraine. Because Russia laid out three or four major goals. One was the complete neutrality of Ukraine, no NATO. The denazification and the demilitarization of Ukraine. And that Russia will not even talk about returning the other five regions that it has since incorporated into the Russian Federation, including Crimea. This leaves no room for compromise. It is a complete and total victory that Russia must achieve. And people in Russia, and what I'm reading, is they believe that Russia will have to go all the way to Odessa and completely control the Black Sea and assume or annex some 44, 45% of what is today Ukraine and reduce it to a rump state. Um, and from what I'm hearing and reading, I don't know what you're hearing over there, but Russia is is winning a an overwhelming victory on the ground in Ukraine. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I'm reading the same thing that Russia daily is gaining, gaining, gaining ground, heading west, uh, securing the Donbass, uh, pushing the increasingly desperate Ukrainian troops. Uh, you can't even hardly call them troops. You know, they're just grabbing people off the street, giving them a week of training, and then throwing them onto the front line where they uh, die, they say, within a day or two. So, uh, you know, I think the Trump plan is going to be create a Korean-style DMZ, a line, uh, you know, a, a a line where the current contact is now, uh, and then rebuild Ukraine's military capability over the years so that they can continue to fight in time. So a ceasefire now, build this line of DMZ, bring in NATO countries to guard the DMZ. Russia's never going to agree to that because they know that it just means war again at some point in time and nothing really changes. So I think uh, Russia really doesn't have any other choice other than to uh, demilitarize Ukraine, as denazify Ukraine, as they've always uh, said, was their goal. Yeah, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, Russia knows that if they don't cut the head of the snake off this time, they know that it's just a matter of time before the Zionists regroup, rearm, and come at them again. Uh, it took a long time, I think, for Russia, from President Putin and his closest advisors to realize they cannot trust the Zionists, the, those people who control the United States of America and NATO and all of the EU. And I think that uh, the Russian people understand this. You know, they've been invaded for centuries, and most recently by Napoleon and then by Hitler. And in that last patriotic war, 27 million people died at the hands of the Nazis. Uh, this is firmly branded, imprinted into the minds and the culture uh, of of most Russians. So let's get back. Let me, uh, Go let ahead. Me comment. Yeah. Let me comment on this situation in the United States Congress. For anyone that doubts that the Zionists have total control 
of the United States Congress, I want to tell a story. Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, a black woman, progressive, really a radical, from Atlanta, Georgia, ran for Congress, got elected, and she said immediately into her office, <clears throat> walked people from APAC, the American Israeli Political Action Committee, who put a piece of paper on her desk and said, we want you to sign this pledge. And it was a pledge to always support Israel. She refused. And they told her that we will take you out in the next election. <clears throat> and they did. And at the same time, one other person in the whole country, a black congressman from uh, Alabama also refused, and they took him out after the next election. She eventually ran again, got back into the Congress, Again, she refused to sign the pledge, and APAC took her out again. Currently, there's one congressman in the entire uh, uh, House of Representatives in Washington, a guy by the name of Massey. He's a Republican from Kentucky. He refuses to sign APAC's pledge. They tried to take him out in this recent election, and he uh, was able to uh, get reelected. But he's the only one in the entire Congress that has uh, refused to sign this pledge to Israel. It shows their power, the power of the money, how they'll spend a million dollars on a local congressional race to take you out if you don't do their bidding. That's the situation in Washington today. Yeah, and you know, I interviewed my good friend, uh, Sylvia Demarest. She's a retired attorney from Dallas, very famous and prominent. We did a show uh, a few months ago uh, about exactly this, the power of the IPAC and the Zionists in controlling all of the United States Congress, the Senate and the House, uh, and they are powerful. And if you don't do their bidding, as you said, they will destroy you. They'll, des they'll not only get you out, but they'll destroy your reputation. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Trump's picks again. Um, you know, you mentioned there were a couple of them that seemed hopeful. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Let's start with Tulsi. Uh, we met her when she was campaigning for president uh, in Maine, and she seemed very likable. She seemed very honest, very straightforward. You know, she's a, a colonel, I think, or lieutenant colonel in the National Guard or the, the Army. And I think it's the reserves. Um, she's been against war. Uh, tell me a little bit about your thoughts as the director of national intelligence. I would have thought they would have made her the the director of the, the, the Defense Department. Well, uh DNI, as they call it, Director of National Intelligence, her job would be to oversee all of the various intelligence agencies to uh, collect all the information from them, weed through it, figure out what's true and what's not, and give the daily briefing to the president every single morning where she... Uh, gives the uh, Trump the status of what's going on around the world. The neocons have used that position and that power to uh, essentially lie to the president uh, and to get their own way, again, on behalf of this neocon agenda led by the Zionists. So it's a very powerful position. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, the neocons are not at all happy about this appointment and are working already to get rid of it, to get rid of her. In fact, Susan Collins, the one of the US senators from Maine, who's a Republican, has already said that uh, they've collected 10 Republican senators that are gonna oppose several of these picks, including Tulsi Gabbard, uh, Gabbard and RFK Jr and uh, at least one other, uh, the uh, the guy that's been picked to be the 
um, uh, head of uh, the attorney general in the United States. Yeah, uh, Matt, so, Matt Getz. Matt Getz. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. From Fort Walton Beach, Florida, where I lived uh, for a couple of years when I was in high school, a real conservative uh, part of the country. Uh, Gates, as he's called, uh, is opposed to the Ukraine operation, uh, but on other issues, he's really uh, far right. So it's a mixed bag with him, like so many others. All right. So um, I want to get to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. What are your thoughts? Uh, I, you know, I haven't participated in an election since the first Obama scam. Uh, and I refuse to because I, uh, I I believe the system is corrupt and voting doesn't matter. Uh, but when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. jumped ship, uh, one of the big issues I had with him and one of his closest friends, not to be mentioned here, who is a good friend of mine, uh, disowned him because of his support for Israel. But He's basically been about health. He's been about the scam from HHS, from uh, Mr. Fauci and others. What are your thoughts on what he might be able to accomplish? Well, <clears throat> if he's able to get in there, uh, people are now saying that when Obama was president, he had some people that he knew would not uh, be accepted by uh, the by uh, the Senate uh, when they hold hearings to approve a uh, an appointment to the cabinet, and so there's a thing called recess appointments. Okay. When Congress is not in session, you can appoint somebody as president to a cabinet position, and they don't have to go through the hearings. And so some people are predicting that some of these more difficult uh, uh, choices like Gabbard and RFK and Getz and anybody else like that, that Trump might do, use the recess appointment thing. Apparently, when Obama did it, nobody complained. I'm sure if Trump did it, all hell would break loose. But RFK Jr., you're right. On on, uh, I, I, I was very much in favor of his running for president when he first came out because he, he was talking about Ukraine. He was talking about, you know, uh, just no war, stopping the wars. And, and, and as you said, the health and uh, the whole uh, big pharma control of the, uh, the drug industry. Uh, but then when he uh, went nuts uh, in defense of uh, Israel, you know, I dropped him like a hot potato. But the point is that, uh, the HHS, they say, has the biggest bu budget of any other ca uh, cabinet uh, position in the country. And that it's it's health, it's uh, food, you know, it's so many applications uh, that are that are covered there uh, where you have uh, agribusiness, you got big pharma, all these various interests uh, that are controlling this department at this present time. So if he was to be able to uh, be in there, uh, and I think he has supreme knowledge about all these issues because he's been working on it his entire adult life. I think uh, he could do some good things. Uh, so that one, a lot of people are a little bit hopeful about, uh, in spite of the fact that he's uh, become a big is Israel supporter. All right. I want to shift gears. I want to get to this uh, Matt Gates, uh, Attorney no. General, and Tulsi in charge of uh, the the uh, director of national intelligence, which puts her really in charge of the CIA and the FBI and the other 18 or whatever intelligence agencies there are, all of these are Trump's enemies. They are the ones who have persecuted him since his first term. Do you think Trump wants revenge? Well, uh... He might want revenge or he just might want to clean it all up. I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily use the word revenge, uh, but uh, I'm sure he wants to uh, clean it up 
uh, I, I can understand why he would, as you say. They've been the ones that accused him of Russiagate uh, repeatedly and are still doing it now. I mean, some of these same neocons are saying that Tulsi Gabbard is a Russian agent. <laughs> so, you know, there you go again, right? Uh, so anyway, I think it's going to be a fascinating uh, trip uh, through this process. All right. Here's here's another one. Uh, a special new department um, to reduce the Fed, the federal bureaucracy, to reduce the the waste in government with Elon Musk and and Vasiswamy. I don't know if I pronounced his name right. Uh, I, I I thought this was great. I would hope that that could come about. What are your thoughts on those two? Well, I noticed yesterday that Musk tweeted that the Pentagon has failed another audit. They can't, at this time, uh, uh, give uh, with any confidence um, a paper trail for hundreds of billions of dollars that are missing in this recent audit from their budget. So if he was to go after the Pentagon budget, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, I worry, though, that uh, he's going to cut a lot of human needs programs, environmental mm. programs, things like that, uh, and then get that money redirected to his Mars missions, okay, that are going to just be colossally expensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, he keeps wearing this shirt. When he would go to Trump rallies, he would always wear this shirt, Occupy Mars, so, you know, that's his agenda to go out to Mars. He says he wants to create a new civilization, but I think that's a lie. I think what Trump wants to do is to begin the mining of Mars for precious resources like magnesium, cobalt, uranium, other such things. So, uh, and but that's, again, a huge, huge cost. And so where is that money going to come from? in a country that now has $36 trillion of debt. Well, how about Social Security? How about Medicare? How about Medicaid? Those are the programs that the aerospace industry has been claiming for more than 30 years that they're going to defund in order to pay for their programs to move into space. We're talking about Trump's appointments, uh, there are a number of Republican senators in the Republican-controlled Senate, which is the one that approves these appointments. Uh, how successful do you think Trump can be now that the Republicans have the majority in the House and the Senate? Well, I think he's going to get most of everything he wants. There, the, <clears throat> the guy named Senator Thune from South Dakota uh, that was just elected as the chairman of the Senate, the majority leader of the Senate for the Republicans, is a neocon. Uh, he's an ally of uh, Mitch McConnell, who was the last leader, the senator from Kentucky, so, who was a deep stater. And so Thune is more of a deep stater. He had a challenger that was more of a Trump ally, and uh, but Thune won. So anyway, I don't think Trump's going to get every everything he wants, but I think he's going to get the vast majority of things he wants. Give me an example of some of the things you think he's going to get. Uh, he's going to get more tax cuts for the rich. He's going to get sanctions on China. He's going to get uh, a constant militarization of uh, foreign policy, a constant militarization of American society, where the only jobs in town, so to speak, are going to be military production jobs and military bases. Um, I think it's, uh, there's going to be major, major efforts. They're already introducing legislation 
while Biden is still president, to make it more difficult to protest against Israel's genocidal poli uh, policies in the Middle East. They want to make it basically illegal to protest against Israel's policies, saying that it's anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism is bad, and therefore anybody uh, that is uh, making uh, anti-Semitic speech must be shut down and even jailed. They're going to go after immigrants. They're going to deport some number of immigrants. Uh, he says he wants to get all get rid of all illegal aliens. I don't think that's likely to happen because a lot of them are doing the jobs that nobody else wants to do. And so there's going to be a lot of companies, big businesses, that are going to push back on Trump on that issue. But I'm sure they'll uh, do enough to uh, satisfy some of the voters who, for them, that was a huge issue, you know, the, the border and the illegal immigration. So things like that, I think, are he's going to have his way uh, with the Congress. Yeah, you mentioned Social Security with, uh, with Musk, you know, wanting to get more money for his trip to Mars and colonization of Mars. Uh, what, how safe do you think Social Security is? Do you think they're, they're ever going to be able to just destroy it or just raid it again? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think for people our age, they can't, they can't just take it away. But what they can do is people who are the age of our children, for example, they could begin to uh, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it, restrict it, and move it on out. So, you know, privatize Social Security, put it into Wall Street's hands, where you then, over a period of time, lose it, uh, especially as the economy begins to collapse, as it well, continues to collapse as it now is. So I think that's how they would do it. Uh, you mentioned the collapse of the economy. Uh, I have been saying for some time uh, that the American global economy is in a very rapid freefall decline. People over here just cannot believe it. They can't get their heads around the fact that the United States and the United States uh, petrodollar is in rapid decline, and and eventually, it's it's going to collapse, totally collapse. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier, the national debt now is thirty six trillion, but I forget how many billions of United States people are in debt because they're putting everything on their credit card. They're borrowing, yeah. borrowing, borrowing. And the two of these put together really spell unsustaining, unsustainable. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, uh, progressive economists like Richard Wolf, for example, uh, who went to school, went to college years ago, with the people that are running the economy today. He knows them very well. And he knows the way they think and the way they operate. And he's predicting that we're already in this slide and it's going to escalate and it's going to come sooner than we think. There's all kinds of people, even mainstream Wall Street investment class people that are talking about, you better buy gold now because we're we're heading for the crash. You can't sustain this. $36 trillion in debt. The military, $1 trillion a year, which is equal to what we pay on interest on the debt every year, $1 trillion a year, the same amount the Pentagon gets. And then at the same time, as BRICS is de-dollarizing, right? Leading countries de-dollarizing, uh, Russia and China and other nations are selling are selling their bonds, the American bonds, you know, that they've bought over the years, essentially 
they were investing in America, they're pulling out. And so all these things are coming together at one time. Of course, we're going to have a collapse. Inflation is just dramatic. I mean, I'm always, every time I go to the grocery store, I look at the price of a can of beans. And beans have increased in price in the last year or so, or at least since COVID. Beans have doubled and tripled in price just for a can of beans. So, and, and, and that's happening across the board on everything that we buy these days. You go to a restaurant anymore for lunch and you buy a sandwich and a cup of soup and a, 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 a soda or something like that, it costs you 20 some bucks. I mean, it's outrageous. Uh, two of you, that's 40, 40 some dollars for lunch. We used to pay that for dinner. We're having a couple of drinks, you know, some beer and some wine. You go to a restaurant for dinner and have drinks uh, along with your dinner now, it's uh, $60, $70. I mean, people can't afford to continue to live this way. It's going to collapse. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people here need to hear that and understand it because I think it's hopeful. Uh, now, I'm going to get to you made a comment about BRICS and de-dollarization. But before we get to that, I want to stay on Trump for a couple more minutes. Uh, you talked about how he's militarizing everything. He has, has threatened to use the United States military domestically. And, you know, this is one thing that is against the Constitution. They cannot do it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, to me, this this is like, this is totalitarianism. Uh, totalitarianism. It's a dictatorship when you can use your military against your own people. Forget what they've used the CIA and the FBI and the NSA against us, but now the military. Well, he's threatened it particularly about student protests on on Gaza at the universities. Uh, that he'll send in troops to uh, uh, bust the protests to pieces. Uh, I don't think he cares whether uh, it's illegal or not. And with the Supreme Court now six to three margin with these uh, uh, conservative appointments, they might not uh, uphold the Constitution. So uh, I think we're in big trouble. There's no doubt about it. I also want to mention, you didn't ask me about the Secretary of State appointment. Oh. <laughs> Marco Rubio, Cuban-American from Miami, a right-winger if there ever was one. He hates Cuba. He hates Venezuela. He hates Nicaragua. He's going to be the Secretary of State. He wants uh, to continue the Russia sanctions. But the other thing I read that is very interesting, <clears throat> I think I read it on Sputnik, that the uh, Russian foreign ministry is saying that he, uh, uh, Rubio has been sanctioned by Russia and he is not allowed to enter Russia. And so here you have the potential secretary of state that will not be able to go to Russia to uh, discuss diplomatic uh, issues. Uh, th this is a real, uh, <laughs> uh, for me, uh, wonderful uh, development that it's pretty clear that Rub Rubio is going to uh, get that uh, appointment. Uh, he's going to be approved by the Senate. But the fact that he can't enter Russia, that's great. That's great. That's a real slap in the face to the United States. You know what is so terribly disturbing is <clears throat> I, I don't know when the last legitimate, credible United States ambassador to Russia has been, to the United Nations, and the State Department, Secretary of State. When you compare these hacks, uh, Nikki Haley, uh, Samantha Powers, uh, this imbecile little creep, Tony Blinken, when you compare them to anybody in the Russian diplomatic service, it's so embarrassing. 
It is really so embarrassing. They just use anger and hate and, you know, those neocon bullet points repeatedly, repeated. It's it's really a terrible state of affairs in terms of diplomacy between what's left of the United States and the rest of the world. Um, well, let me just... Let me just add this real, real quickly. Uh -huh. On the good side, I mean, mostly we're, everything we're talking about is bad news, right? So what's the good side? There's always an Achilles heel, you know, to everything. What's the Achilles heel for the Trump administration? It's this fact that they're so arrogant. They're swimming in American exceptionalism. and But that's going to drown them. They're going to drown in American exceptionalism. This cabinet that they've appointed, this direction that they're going, that this country is going, uh, is, this arrogance is going to accelerate the collapse of the American empire on every level. And so that is the good side, that in fact, they're so blind with their big, strong, muscular military and everything else. They're so blind, though, they can't see that they're destroying the country and it, and they're destroying their relationship with most of the world. Yeah, well, let's, let's uh, segue and transition to BRICS. Uh, you know, last month, the BRICS held their, their Congress in Kazan, Russia. And there were... Uh, there were over 20,000 people there, delegates, 36 countries. They represent uh, most of the rest of the world, Asia uh, and the global south, Africa, South America. Uh, their GDP will soon pass that of the G20. Um, all of the discussion here on this side of the water, the oceans, is about this new world order that is already here and growing and emerging. And you, when you talk to people privately, uh, they will tell you, yes, it's all about de-dollarization. They will tell you that we're tired of the United States hegemony domination, threats, military, killing of our people as they've done with the other European white colonialists. They're fed up with it. But you know what? They don't want America to have a crash landing. They're hoping for a somehow soft landing. And I think China must believe the same thing because China is so dependent on the United States today for all of these exports and the industry that the United States has shipped off to China and Southeast Asia and Vietnam and the Philippines and whatever. So the emergence of BRICS is very hopeful. But on the other hand, it's a great threat to the Zionist. What will they do when they realize they've lost their control and power over the rest of the globe. Your thoughts? Well, that's what I said earlier in, in this interview. I talked about that Russian political scientist that is saying that Trump's number one strategy is going to be to go after BRICS because they know that uh, Trump and, the, and the Wall Street and the military industrial complex knows that their power will be negated by this growing BRICS organization uh, as they de-dollarize. And, uh, you know, it's BRICS is creating new markets for China. China is aware that the U.S. is going to collapse. There's no stopping it now. Now, yeah, there could be a smoother landing, but I don't think it's going to happen that way because th these people are so arrogant. Uh, you know, they... Uh, it's going to be a hard landing. It's already a hard landing for the American people. That's why Trump won this election, because working class people, black people, Latinos in the 
highest percentage ever voted for Republicans. Well, there's a reason for that. It's because Democrats weren't doing anything for them. Democrats didn't give a damn about them. And so people voted against them because it was their only hope. It was a protest vote. Now, is Trump going to betray that protest? I think he will because he is controlled by these same Zionist interests who don't care about these people any more than the Democrats do. So I think that's the reality. So China is going to have new markets in Africa and Latin America and Asia that they'll turn to rather than the West. I mean, if you know Trump has threatened to put a 60% tariff on Chinese products, well, hell, nobody's going to buy anything you know, from China that's going to have a, a, a tariff that high. So China is just going to sell those products to another country and, uh, and continue to uh, flourish. Yeah, the That's sad thing reality. is, the sad thing is just about everything Americans buy now is made in China or somewhere over there, at least the important things. I mean, everything from, I mean, clothes to machines to John Deere tractors to high tech to Huawei telephones. And it's, it's all coming from China and Apple. It's all coming from China. Uh, so well, that's one thing Trump has talked about is he wants to bring uh, uh, the uh, manufacturing base back to this country because he's he's recognizing that. So that might be one thing he's able to succeed in doing. But how long is that going to take? Yeah. How long does that take to, you know, bring that back, get the investment build production facilities, create products, distribute them across the country. That's going to take some time. And especially if you're already having a, a economic collapse uh, because of the growth of BRICS and the de-dollarization. So he, and they're in a real bind in this country right now. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's going to be a soft landing at all either. And the Greek, the, the BRICS nations plus uh, is is becoming so powerful and they're not militarized. They're, they're not talking about using military force. They're talking about using international law, the principles of the UN Charter and the sovereignty and respect and dignity of all countries, no matter how large or small. I mean, this is this is very hopeful. Um, okay, I, I want to ask you one last thing about Trump and what we're talking about. They tried to kill him twice, maybe. I'm not sure I'm completely convinced that he got shot in the ear. I, I don't know. I mean, I've had so many different people tell me it was all fake. But Trump is a threat to a lot of people. He always has been. What are your thoughts on an assassination attempt on Trump? I think it's possible. But don't forget, Trump is damn near the same age as Joe Biden. And he's exhibited a few times during this recent campaign that he was beginning to slip a few gears. Oh. So... I think, you know, and they say that Trump loves McDonald's hamburgers and French fries, <laughs> which is not a healthy diet at all. So I think he'll be lucky. He'll be extremely lucky to finish this term, but I doubt even that. I think I'll give him two years, and I think he will become, uh, he's either going to have a heart attack, or he's going to have some kind of cancer, or... He's going to become senile like Biden. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that Trump is going to last out his four-year term. I, I'd be surprised if he did. Now, will they assassinate him? They, they very well might, because they've shown repeatedly that they do that, both in this country and all over the world. When they don't like somebody, they'll take, they'll take them out one way or the other. So... Uh, I think it's it, it's it's a possibility. 
there's also a possibility that some of these cabinet members that the deep state doesn't like, like an RFK or a Tulsi Gabbard, could also be assassinated during this coming time. So I think this could be a really uh, difficult, bloody time for America uh, if this kind of uh, direction uh, opens up. And it yeah. wouldn't surprise me if it did. Yeah, that's been a question that's been on my mind uh, throughout this entire electoral process. I want to finish on a completely different note, but not so different. Uh, you're very involved in protest against the United States Israeli genocide in Gaza, Palestine. It doesn't stop there. It's Lebanon, it's Syria, uh, it's uh, Iran. Iran is the next one that they have wanted to destroy. Uh, what are your thoughts on where all that's headed? Well, first of all, I say I was really happy to see that the prime minister from Malaysia has called for Israel to be kicked out of the United Nations wow. because of their genocidal activities. I think this is really very important. And it's my hope that other countries around the world will join that uh, demand. It should, Israel should be kicked out. They don't deserve to be in the family of nations. They're a genocidal, brutal, evil uh, nation. 44% of the people that have been killed in Gaza so far are children. 44%. Now, what does it take? Now, if Russia was killing uh, innocent people at the rate that Israel is doing it, they would have been kicked out of the UN. All right? Russia was sanctioned. They were kicked out of all kinds of international organizations. But Israel, no way. Nobody does anything. Nobody stops doing anything. What happened to the world court? Why aren't they doing anything after they made their initial determination that Israel, it appeared that Israel is doing genocidal activities, but we have to investigate further? Well, what the hell have they done? These institutions that the U.S. and the EU control, like the U.N., the World Court, etc., they, they need to be either reformed or, or gotten rid of. I mean, it's just absolutely impossible. Is Israel is the most dangerous nation on this earth and must be stopped immediately before they get us all killed. And I, I want to I want to add this. This is not anti-Semitism. This is anti-Zionism. These are Zionists. They are not Jews. They are not biblical Jews. They are a poisonous race that has for centuries now been owning and controlling through finance, through money, through usury, the entire globe. I think well, it's in very... this country, in this country, there are legions of Jewish citizens who are protesting against Israel's genocide, going to jail, speaking out regularly, and now, increasingly, we're hearing people inside of Israel, very prominent people. And the newspaper Haaretz, uh, one of the most uh, respected newspapers in, inside of Israel, is repeatedly reporting on these crimes of the Zionists. So you're, ex you're exactly right. So, Bruce, I want to conclude on this. Uh, we've been talking about Trump. He has been a big supporter of Israel. Do you think he can afford to continue that? Well, he got a, a, a million dollars from uh, Mrs. Edelman. Yeah, but uh, did he really need that million bucks? He took it. Uh, you know, and, and you look at his appointments, the ambassador to the UN, the Zionist, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the ambassador to Israel, Mike Huckabee, a Christian fundamentalist, oh, the Zionist. Man. Oof. I mean, these are horrible appointments. So Trump is rewarding these Zionist donors 
that gave him all this money. And it sure sounds like uh, this, you know, this Secretary of Defense, Pete Pegsith, uh, there's controversy developing around him having uh, just now it's coming out that he's been uh, doing uh, uh, ab abuse towards women. And uh, people are saying that he might be in danger of uh, being replaced before he even makes it into the, uh, into the Pentagon. But uh, he's a crazy Zionist. So, you know, Trump is appointing a slew of these people. So it looks to me like, you know, he's on board. Now, whether he's going to go full blast war with Iran, well, that's, a, that's an open question. Uh, we're told that the people in the Pentagon have been arguing against fighting Iran because U.S. and Israel would lose. So will Trump listen to that? That's yet to be seen. We don't know.